Hello, it is me again. After all the news that came out of Contenders Overwatch League, I've been watching the scene from a distance. I'm not actively trying to get my foot in it, but I have a lot of players I care about and a lot of things that I'd like to see happen in the scene. I want to see everybody be successful. I want to see everything, you know, work out in the end. But as it sits right now, I... I've always had serious criticisms of the contender system and how the farm system works for Overwatch League and and how players make money and, and all of this other stuff in the league. And it got me wondering after Florida, Paris, and uh, there's another team to release the roster. It's escaping my brain right now. Um, do, do, do. I can't remember who it was, but uh, basically they released their entire rosters, and then there have been other players that have been removed for uh, whether it's synergistic reasons or you know other stuff. Like it's it's it, everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. But when I was doing some research on contenders teams slash owl, I had to give it time. I had to wait and see if the system was flawed, and if there was data and statistics to prove that it's flawed. After doing some research gathering and some meddling, no, I wouldn't say meddling, uh, meddling's a bad word. After doing some research and fact checking, which has taken me quite some time, um, I come up with some interesting numbers, and this academy system slash contender system don't mix they're like oil and water and to that i actually think that the contenders just contenders system could be something that is beneficial to players developing talent and feeding into the overwatch league while being a sustainable tier two option but with that like i said with a grain of salt after doing some research and fact checking and doing some numbers and running it and giving it, you know, over a year and a half to to unfold before my eyes, I am officially of the opinion that owl teams need to be removed from contenders. Academy teams need to not exist. And there are multiple reasons for this. Um, one of the first reasons is, is owl teams think that because they're putting money into the T2 scene, that they are entitled to, to protect that investment, which shouldn't be the case. Your investment was in the Overwatch League, and your franchise league is what you're protected in. The Academy system and the T2 system needs to be washed clean. You cannot have protected slots. You can't have uh, Academy team go out, get relegated. You know, I'm not going to say any names. And then come back and buy another team's slot, replace the entire roster with people they want. Like, shit like that can't fly. And it, there's never been a tracking of it over time. So, you'll see, like, one of the biggest roster moves and criticisms I've ever had was the XL2 situation. Uh, a few months ago, uh, XL2 basically gutted their roster. And they said they were going to go farm local New York talent. And they were going to take that local New York talent and get it to Owl because they believed that the New York ecosystem had enough strong players and that with development, they could put those players into a position, investing time and resources into said players and, you know, turn a profit from a business perspective, you know, develop a brand around New York. I get it. After all of the time that has passed, that has completely and utterly failed. There are other teams that have, you know, their rosters that they've parted ways with people. People have been called up. People have been traded. You know, it's it's league momentum. Stuff moves around. But there are big, big red flags in some of these roster releases that, at the beginning, the New York XL thing made sense to me on paper. From a business perspective, I understood it. From, uh professional standpoint as a coach i understood it you know you have to build the brand you have to have a product to sell but this goes back to the orgs thinking that they're entitled to protect an investment new york excel arguably 
had a good roster and then gutted it and then, in my opinion, performed worse than they did with the roster they had previously because of this branding decision. There are other rosters and other teams that have also made these decisions, but they do it not as openly. Uh, in my opinion, the New York XL thing was just a giant press stunt that was to generate traction, brand, and they didn't really care about it. Because contenders to them is a fucking throwaway. They don't actually fucking care about contenders. If they did, they wouldn't have made that decision. They wouldn't have outright cut the players. They would have sold them, they would have traded them, they would have kept them on the bench. They would have kept them under their contracts. They made it purely from a business perspective, and they're using contenders as a tool. They, they aren't the only organization. Uh, I think that New York as an owl organization is an amazing organization, but as a contenders organization, I have no respect for their XL2 team. I have respect for Adam as a player and as a coach. I have respect for their staff. I do not have respect for the organization and the brand. There are other organizations and other brands that I have lacked respect for, but I respect the people who work there. And I understand the business decisions. I understand... You have to make these hard choices and hard decisions, and you have to build a brand that you're selling. But this is counterintuitive to the whole contender system, which is to develop talent and give people who are not already a chance to develop, make some money, not be, you know, I'm making 50k a year, I don't have to worry about shit. Make some money while doing something on the side. This is where we get into the Kurt Warner story. Kurt Warner bagged groceries until he got a call to go fucking quarterback. You know, these are the Kurt Warners. There is no goddamn reason an organization should be stepping on the toes of the kid who's bagging groceries and fucking using him as a PR stunt. It's completely and utterly stupid, unethical, and nobody's going to call people on it. And it happens. It, but it happens over such a long period of time that everybody forgets about it. Um, not to, to harp on XL, but going back to some of their staff, Bare Hands was at XL. He helped build that roster. Um, I have actual massive respect for him in building that roster and helping them create that, that inaugural season. He's now at Florida. Mayhem Academy just caught their entire roster after putting up one of the best contender positions possible. Why would you do that? The excuse slash decision that the brand has said is they want a team that is more synergistic with the, their OWL team. Your OWL team just got completely overhauled. Why are you overhauling your contenders team for an OWL team that isn't even stabilized standard or out in the open? Why are you, you making that decision when arguably at one point your contenders team was better than your OWL team? And it wasn't the players and it wasn't the coach's fault. I, I have a strong feeling that at Florida, there was a bunch of stuff going on behind the scenes that I can only speculate on. I don't have any proof. I don't have any fact. It's just pure speculation. But I feel like behind the scenes, there is a massive clusterfuck in the administration side and the leadership side. And I don't think it was Mineral's fault. I think Mineral got a bad rap. I, when I was at Renegades know the feeling of taking all of the support staff stuff on your shoulders. I worked at Renegades pretty much solo outside of uh, my manager helping me, doing all of the coaching, analytics, fucking practice schedules. My manager helped me with everything else that was business related. But it, I, I understand that burden. So I think Mineral got the short end of the stick. So going back to brands protecting their investments, I do not think that these academy teams are anything more than a PR stunt. And all the OWL teams are paying for, for these contender slots, is ownership of the slot. So, to give a short breakdown real quick, when you as a team qualify for trials or contenders, you have to designate someone that is not a player on the roster i.e. a manager, i.e. a coach, to take control and ownership of that slot. They now own it. They technically, quote-unquote, have the deed to it. So at the end of the day, if they decide to cut four people from the roster because team things, you know, teams, rifts happen. People get poached. You have to rebuild the roster. Sometimes it doesn't work as well as it could. Um, you have to rebuild. That's fine. 
But that person now has sole ownership. If any of the owl organizations get to said person and they buy that slot from that person for a predisclosed amount, they now own that slot and they have the right to make the decisions of what happens to that roster. So going back to owl orgs protecting their quote unquote investment in contenders, you have teams that buy slots even after they're relegated or even after they have failed in a season. They could have a successful contender season, but their owl season was a complete and utter shamble. But because of things that are going on behind the scenes, the contenders players are suffering for the organization's failures. Which is why, I, of my opinion as of right now, I think that owl teams need to leave the contender system entirely. And they need to make it so that contenders players have a safe place to develop. And a safe place where talent can be grown. Um, I did some some number crunching on Owls, estimated probabilities of making Overwatch League. Uh, I went back and I've checked almost all of them. And I've excluded expansion teams. And then I looked at lateral transfers. And I looked at all the actual hard data of players moving. And this is of... I think I went... I did the inaugural season of Overwatch League all the way up till now. So players, everything that I could check that was current without going onto Twitter and, and looking at roster moves that were quiet or happened behind closed doors. You know, players got released and there wasn't a public statement about it. Player retired, there wasn't a public statement about it. You know, people just want to back out and bow out quietly. So there's some variance of error in these stats. But when I went and I collected these stats, some shocking numbers to me actually came up. And when you look at the contender structure, so we'll go to North America. So NA West. Of the NA West teams, you have these academy teams that feed quote unquote like a tier two system into the overwatch league these are again overwatch league teams investing in the t2 scene and again it's not all of them but because there are one or two that are making these decisions from their overwatch league standpoint and not protecting the contender standpoint it's undermining the league as contenders so one of the big problems with the structure of contenders without these teams is there's no money. There's no money in the scene. How is, you know, am I supposed to, you know, be a kid going to school full time and play full time? If I've got bills, you know, I don't live at home. You know, the these organizations alleviate that pressure for the players. But then there are organizations that don't have financial backing that are playing just as well as these contenders teams. So it's not about the money. It's statistically proven in the results of the contender season there are teams that are doing better than uh academy teams and it comes down to what is being developed what isn't being developed one of the actual best ones in my opinion is sky foxes sky foxes has been around after they made the gauntlet run um through contenders through open division and they've churned out talent, they've grabbed talent, they've been stable. There's been nothing truly amazing or bad out of it. You know, it's been pretty quiet, but they've done well. They've competed against these academy teams. And then you look at some of the academy teams, and some of the academy teams just... <laughs> I'm sorry, if you're an academy team, and you're putting money into your roster, into contenders... You have the ability to poach talent from other teams by offering a salary and you get relegated. What were you doing? <laughs> what, what were you doing? Like, it's okay to be loyal to players. It's okay to, you know, stick with things. But I'm, I'm sorry. There's no reason you should have gotten relegated. There's no reason. Why? What happened? What happened? Anyway, moving past that, getting back on track, these teams can't compete, and they do it without the money. So the money isn't what makes these teams successful. It comes down to a mix of the coaches, the players, the schedules, what they're doing. So they're finding success. 
So why do we have to have these academy teams when all these academy teams are doing is using these players as a tool? So if we go to the Overwatch League. We look at all 20 of the teams. Um, when you look at these rosters, not all of these teams are fielding 12-man rosters because they are fielding academy teams. There are some teams that are, you know, not fielding 12 people, you know, not fielding 12 people, not fielding 12 people, because it is cheaper to field an academy team than it is to fill your bench out because of the league standards and minimums. Teams are using the contender system, in my opinion, to get around paying players the league minimum and carrying a 12-player roster. Um, arguably, some of the new expansion teams that are just now coming up, I excluded a lot of them from my stats and statistics because it's not fair to judge something that's brand new. Just like I gave a year for the other teams, I should give these teams a year. So, looking at these OWL teams, I comprised a note from a notepad. Here it is. So, I went through and I looked at every active roster of Overwatch League teams. And I fact-checked their player rosters with people who were not active in Overwatch League Season 1 that came from an Academy team, came from Solo Queue, came from Ladder, came from somewhere. And I got most of these names, you know, I went and I checked and I got most of them. In this, I excluded all expansion teams. And the reason I excluded all expansion teams is they had to pull their players from somewhere. It's not fair to judge Vancouver versus Washington. When Vancouver picked up a full roster and Washington is being built around, I would say, Wizards Vision. But I'm not 100% sure. Again, this is all speculation. But I went through and I compiled all these numbers and I compiled all these players, what role they play, where did they come from, um, did they play, they're in L now, and I went and I did it. So of the 12 teams that were in the OWL original season before the expansion, there was a potential of 144 player slots, 12 players per team, gives you 144. In a roughly about a year and six months, roughly a year and four months. It depends on if you count that weird, awkward time when the preseason happened. So I gave it, you know, that rough time period. 37 new players have joined these teams. And four or three or four of the teams have no new players. And um, that's acceptable when you win or, you know, you don't need new players, you don't need new talent. Like, if you've got a winning formula, you don't have to change it. But there were some things that jumped off the page to me when I was looking through this that didn't make sense to me. So Dallas Fuel. Dallas Fuel only had two players come in. As far as I know, that I can check with stats. Like, again, I said there was variance. Some Dallas Fuel fans going to call me out. Um, Trill and Zachary are the only two people who were not in the Overwatch League prior to this season. So they've only added two new faces after last season, which, to be fair, at the beginning, this makes sense. Towards the end, they started to turn things around, and now arguably that they've added Zachary and they've shored up their coaching staff, they look better. Shanghai Dragons was total dumpster fire. Don't know whose fault it was, dumpster fire. But they brought in lots of new talent. They brought in lots of new... They, they went out and picked up Kongdu, basically. Um... And then you had Florida Mayhem. Florida Mayhem has gone out and they've picked up new people. Florida Mayhem had issues. But again, I don't think it was the players and I don't think it was the coaches. I genuinely think there was front office issues. Um, Philly had a really good season. Still picked up talent. that came from their roster. Their academy team. They developed people they wanted. They knew they were going to bring these people up. Philly is the only team I could find that actually brought people from their own freaking academy team. You put these kids in fucking academy jail. They're the only team I could find that actually did this consistently. Um, Valiant went out and got people. Uh, London Spitfire went out and got people. Uh, Gladiators. The, the Panker situation, I would put Gladiators on that same echelon as Philly of the teams that actually developed talent. Because Gladiators actually pushed a lot of talent. 
into Overwatch League. But I feel like the LA Gladiators basically went and tried to get Kongdu roster, and it didn't work out. And Shanghai Dragons and Gladiators basically got into a bidding war, and they split. Or somebody wanted certain pieces, I don't know. My speculation shit's going off again. I, I, again, going back to it, you look at these, you know, San Francisco Shock got two new people. And then you go look at Boston Uprising. Uprising has an amazing eye for talent. They do not develop talent in the T2 scene, in my opinion. They do not develop players and then bring them up. They go out and they find talent, which is what Boston's good at. Boston is the premier example of what Overwatch League teams should be doing. Because they didn't go out and they didn't buy an entire roster. They went out and they got the pieces they wanted, the pieces they need, and they went and got these players from organizations. Uh, Shang, uh, Boston. My brain is escaping me. I used this name. I can't remember what SD is. Oh my god, my brain died. I'm sorry, video. Anyway, <laughs> this is another team that went out and got Korean talent, which there's nothing wrong with. Um, I actually think that this is, uh, Another one of the ones that was... This is where they went out and they got the pieces they wanted. Um, but yeah. Uh, anyway, going back to the statistics after talking about that for a little bit. There were 144 player slots. Not all of them were filled because academy teams existed and they couldn't... They weren't forced to fill these slots. So you had teams floating six, seven-man rosters with a single coach being like, that's going to fly. You're an owl. Fill your fucking roster. There's no excuse. There is no excuse for you not to have a staff, not to have a fucking full roster, and not be putting up a fight in the league. There were 144 potential slots. Of those slots, 37 new players came into the league. These 37 names, and then I excluded anyone who transferred laterally from an owl team to an owl team, or went to contenders from Owl and then came back into Owl on another franchise. So somebody who went from an Owl team to their academy team because of reasons and then got bought out and is now playing on another team. I excluded those people. So 37 new people were picked up into the league. Seven academy teams were feeding into Owl during this time. Um... I didn't include the most recent expansion, because again, these expansion teams shouldn't be judged right now. They should be judged later, slash when things have actually had time to develop, and you can pull statistical analysis from. Um, so seven teams. Players fed from those seven teams was 11. One third of the new players came from academy teams. This means that you are two times as likely to get into OWL versus academy teams. Because people go out and they get the talent they want and they need. Academy teams aren't developing what fucking people want or need. They're developing what they think their brand needs. And with these teams, where you can see where I wrote down where they came from, the only team that developed what they actually needed or wanted was Philly. And I have a strong feeling they would keep Zachary if they could have. They would have kept Zachary. So all of you, uh, Fusion University would have gone. I have a strong feeling Dallas paid a pretty penny for Zachary. I cannot confirm this, but I have a strong feeling it. Going back to that, that means that you have two times the chance not being on an OWL Academy team, making it into OWL from contenders. Of those 37 players that made it, Eight were main tanks. Three were flex tanks. Um, I excluded... So the flex tank one I should I should highlight here. So the flex tank position currently in the Overwatch League is not actually the flex tank. Most DPSs are playing the actual quote-unquote flex tank role. Most everybody else is a diva bot, which leads to this number being what it is. That's why you have players, in my opinion, like Hot Date, um, Gods just got picked up recently, 
Um, there are a lot of good flex tanks, like really good flex tanks and contenders, and this is why they're suffering, because the meta doesn't favor picking up these divas, Zarya's, and tanks that you need. You don't need a Roadhog right now, you need a freaking Bridget and a Sombra, um, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, supports, 13, and 13 DPS got picked up. This actually shocked me. I didn't think this many DPS and supports got picked up, but they did. All right, so I need my calculator now. All right, so to find out the average of players versus stuff, we take the number of new players, so 37, and we divide that by 144 slots. If I can type. That gives us around 25%. So 25% of the league was replaced. I think it's just over... I think it's 25.8% actually. When I did the actual math math. Um, this is just rough shit. Um, but it's 28% of the league is, is contender's talent. And on paper, that sounds amazing. That is a higher turnaround rate than almost every other sport professionally. And I actually looked this up because I was curious. So... If you want to go from college, and I'm using contenders as the college system, to go from college to the pros, this is from the NCAA. These are their research statistics. This is the number of people who have participated, the number of draft picks. So in drafts, instead of using draft picks, we'll use player signings. Um... And then we'll use the who made it there. So just instead of using draft picks, we'll use signing. And we'll look at it. So baseball, from NCA to the pros, you have almost a 10% chance to make it. In men's basketball, you have around a 1.2%. So this is the 1% of the 1%. Because 1% of high school athletes, on average, makes it into Division One college basketball. Um... Women's basketball is the same thing. It's the 1% of the 1%. In football, I think it's this American football. Again, I'm not 100% sure. I'm assuming they're talking about the NFL. Uh, it's 2%. And then men's ice hockey, NHL, is 7%. We're throwing out a 25% turnaround rate for our contender system. Our NCAA, per se, is turning around right now 25%. This is not including expansion teams. I excluded expansion teams. That's why there are only 144 slots available when I did the team rosters. So we've turned around 25% of the league through our contender system. That sounds fucking amazing and pristine. But you have to take that with a grain of salt. So we go back to the notes I have. And we pull the calculator back up. Clear. There were 144 slots available, 37 new players. Only 11 of them came from academy teams. So we take 11 and we divide it by that 144. Just over 7% comes from academy teams. The other 15% came from non-academy, non-funded teams. Over a year... Academy-funded teams that are throwing more money at this system could only develop 11 players. I don't know if this is because of the buyouts, and I don't know if this is because of organizations wanting something. But this is a giant red flag when teams and organizations that do not have the same structure and funding and do not have a tie to the league are producing more talent than you do. In my opinion, after I found out about this number, that you are two times more likely to make the Overwatch League if you are not on an academy team, I was actually shocked. I had reservations and issues with this, the academy system, but from a business standpoint, I got it. Numbers like this are completely unacceptable. Now, arguably, there is... A grain of salt to be taken with this and i take a grain of salt with my own numbers and my own statistics and my own grief and grief with this the expansion teams could have pulled from our organization academy teams and i haven't done that research i will go back and i will do that research in a future video 
after I give it time to develop. I was thinking closer towards the end of stage three, where we had a good idea of where everybody's going to finish for the owl season. But as it sits right now, there have only been 11 players fed through academy teams. More players have been released, period, than have been fed up. Which is fine. That's acceptable. But you have players who immediately go to other teams and get picked up. It's, it's, it makes no sense to me. So, I found out about all these statistics. And then, I was curious. The reason I put this, the roles up here was I was actually curious to know what the percentage of the roles that came into the league were. And uh, so we take the 13 for DPS and support, and we divide it by 144. Uh, 9% of the league was new supports and new DPS. Um, and then you look at flex tanks, and flex tanks were 2% of the league that was was picked up. And main tanks were, I think main tanks were 4%. Yeah, it was 5%. 5.5% five five um, of the league. And uh, that set off some red flags. Like, the amount of money slash protection that all teams are asking for in the academy structure doesn't make sense. They're, they're using it as a marketing tool, which they should just keep out of fucking contenders like I, I don't i don't see a point in having these organizations and their structure be in the contender system so with that being said our 25 percent and the probability of making owl is amazing but you're almost two times as like two times more likely to make owl as a unaffiliated player than you are to make it as an academy player which is that's unacceptable the academy turnaround rate should not be that low compared to other teams like that just means either a you don't know what you're looking for and you don't know how to develop talent b you're making signings that are for you and you're not using your team as a actual academy for developing talent you're using it specifically as a tool for yourself and the other option is that you're using it as a tool to develop talent for other people, but you have no clue what the fuck anybody else wants. Um, and that shows. Um, Gladiators, I think, is the only team that, in my opinion, was producing talent that went to other places. Um, Gladiators made a lot of moves. Um, when it came to in-house stuff, I think Fusion was doing the best, and I think that Boston was doing the best at finding talent. So, those three organizations were standouts and contenders. I think everybody else either has a black eye, had a media stunt, or hasn't held up their decision. And when you're talking about 15, 20 contenders teams, and only three of them are fucking doing well, you have an issue. So, what does this mean? In the contender system, we have these academy teams that are putting money into players to quote-unquote develop talent, but they're basically using it as a PR stunt. I think Valiant has done an amazing job and took it on the chin, but they haven't used a Academy team as an excuse, a PR option, anything. I also think that uh, some of the other teams that are not fielding Academy teams that are doing fine or have developed talent are justifiable. And... I genuinely am of the opinion over the last few days that academy teams need to be removed. The Overwatch League teams need to let somebody else handle the T2 system. We need to handle it ourselves. As T2 players, coaches, managers, we need to handle it ourselves. Not go out and find sponsorships, not do anything like that. No, 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 no. There's a simpler solution. Without conflicting with the Overwatch League, it's very simple. If you pull from contenders any player, if you as an OWL team sign a player versus trying to figure out how you're going to split the money up to the team, to the organization, the, the whatever the fuck, fuck buyouts, 
Buyouts and contenders need to not be a thing. Players want to get to Owl. They want to make money for a living. The buyout shit in contenders is fucking stupid. Instead, have everybody play for fight money. You get fight money for, for being on stream. You get fight money for participating. That's 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 where these non-fucking academy teams make the bulk of their money. Every time an OWL team dips into contenders and they get a player, they should fund part of the prize pool for that region. So if Korea pulls 12 people from contenders to OWL, <coughs> the teams that bought those 12 players should contribute more to that reason, region's prize pool. They should be the ones encouraging that region to grow. And then the people who are building the groundwork for that region, the players who are going from Korea to OWL, have laid a foundation and set their region up for better success. So, if in North America 13 players make it, Korea makes 15, and EU has a bad year, the teams that are in the regions that are going to have more fight money are going to have higher competition in the, the open division level and in the contenders level. If we removed academy teams, there wouldn't be a need to protect slots. We could have a full open trial system where, you know, top three stay in contenders. Everybody else goes through a tournament. And it, it, you would see way more cycling. The cycling of players should not happen at the T2 level, at the top tier, where it's you're just about to get into Owl and where you potentially could be picked up. That shit needs to be handled at the bottom of T2 in Trials and in Open Division. That's where all this roster move and all that crap should be. There is no reason for you to break up a roster in Contenders without a player making it into Owl. That's completely unacceptable, especially if they're winning. If they're winning and they're performing and they're doing well, breaking that roster up is a travesty and you're hurting the player's development. There's no reason for that. So, it, of my opinion as of today, and I'll revisit this video at some point, I think that all teams need to be removed from contenders. I do not think they should be in contenders. But I think that if they pull any talent from outside of OWL into their organization, they should contribute as league people who are looking out for the betterment of their own ecosystem should contribute money to the prize pool. So versus having a player with a $50,000 buyout, have it so that they have to contribute $25,000 to the freaking NA prize pool so that we can pay these players that are doing well and winning. And the ones who are winning get the chance to actually sustain themselves. Winning doesn't fucking matter anymore in Overwatch, and it's very obvious. Now, that's another rant for another day, but if you're winning, you should be rewarded. You should be rewarded, not just with safety, not just with, oh, I get to play again next week, I get another chance to show myself off. No, you should get the chance and the reward to sustain yourself through your actions. And with the Academy system protecting rosters, protecting trial slots, buying rosters. Like, if you're an academy team and you get relegated and you buy another slot, I have no respect for you. I will never be a supporter for you. I, I will support the players and the coaches, but I will never support you directly as an organization. Because I've, I've been there. I've, I've done it. I've done a player. I've done a coach. I know I know what the grind is. I know what it takes, and I know what it give you give up for it. And of my opinion, I think that academy teams don't belong in, in contenders. I think that they're actually hindering contenders and hindering player development. Because of the statistics we saw with these players being brought up to OWL over the period of time, all this data points to the fact that OWL teams don't know how to develop talent. And very few of them know how to make talent stick. Because for every name that's up here, somebody got cut. Somebody got let go. Somebody got traded. For every name that is listed here, they replaced someone. And that's unacceptable. As a coach, every time one of my players got cut, it was my failure. Every time one of my players didn't develop, it's my failure. Every time your coach fails, it's the organization's failure. Because you are not doing what you need to support him, and you're not doing what you need to help your staff. So, in turn, 
a coach's failure, it's the organization's failure. So, with this, I think that academy teams are failing in contenders really fucking hard. And all they're using it is a brand growing opportunity. And they're just hurting the players on the scene, in my opinion. I think that as it sits right now, the one of the best courses of action we could do is to remove owl teams from contenders and have them contribute to the prize pools on top of Blizzard. And the owl teams, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think owl teams are paying their due. Um, one of the things that they talked about at the very beginning was, oh, we're paying $20 million for a slot. You get $20 million for a slot. You haven't gotten your returns yet. Because there hasn't been any marketing sharing, and the leaked information we got when Owl was forming was it wouldn't happen until 2020. So we'll have to wait and see. Maybe this will all happen in 2020. But as it sits right now with me looking at it, I do not think contenders teams run by Owl organizations are a fix. They don't do anything. They, they don't help develop talent. They create more drama and they ruin more careers than they help. Like, that's just of my opinion. And I don't think that OWL coaches meddling in academy affairs is fair. As an academy coach, my goal isn't to fucking groom somebody to fucking be the next fucking Shadowburn, the next Surefour, the next Rouge Hong. My goal is to develop them as a player and make them as good as they can be. Make them as best as possible. But everybody else just wants to cookie cutter fucking Rouge Hong. And they don't want to take, you know, the sapphire that they found, the giant ass sapphire and contenders, and put it in a really good setting, and so show how good it can shine. They just want fucking rough cut, small ass diamonds that don't fit the mold. I would rather have a sapphire that's worth $100,000 that looks different, and walks different, and talks different, than a fucking diamond that's worth a thousand bucks that's an imitation of something. I don't want cubic zirconia, which is what everybody's trying to make. And I genuinely feel that academy teams need to be taken out. And it's the, the, I, I'm going to have to reevaluate the numbers again, but right now, as it sits, the proof is in the numbers. Like academy teams aren't pulling their weight in the contender scene. The money is not beneficial for anybody outside of the players who are signed to the roster. And sometimes if you're signed to a roster, you could be kept there specifically so that you don't get to Al. Like, I'm not going to get into the shady shit. I'm not going to get into the, the, the region bias. I'm not going to get into all that. That's stuff for another video. But there's travesties happening in the contender scene that nobody's talking about. And it's part of this. And I feel like the one of the simplest solutions, the easiest way to fix it, and to quote-unquote uncorrupt the T2 system is to just expel all the academy teams. Make them pay in. Their their investment is 100% protected in OWL. They have the rights to the OWL players. They're paying the premium for it. They Make them use their roster space. Make them use their brand that they paid for. Don't let them expand into other places where they could ruin careers. Don't make them go and throw money at players because fucking the player needs money to live to be able to do this. Make them throw money into the scene so the players who are actually winning and doing well can succeed. But that's just my opinion on the subject. If you have any difference of opinions, if you have any different thoughts, let me know in the comments down below. Um, I'll be making more stuff. I'm working on a Havana guide, which has been really rough because Havana is brand new. And that should be coming out in the next week or so. And then again, I'm going to revisit Contenders stuff. And I will be revisiting uh, Open Division stuff uh, probably in the next month. So we look to see videos on my YouTube channel coming up maybe in the next week or so. Thanks everybody for watching. Hope you leave a comment, like, dislike, do you. You can follow me on Twitch. You can follow me on Twitter. All that stuff will be in the box down below. Have a good one.